we go. So today I'm going to be teaching you a poem called The Garden of Love. And uh, first of all, before we get to the actual poem, I'm just going to start off with a little bit of an introduction here. This is like one of those books that you get as a kid where you've got to try and find the guy, you know, and you lift up the patch. There he is. But anyway, okay, so we'll start off. Uh, first of all, this was supposed to be a picture of the poet William Blake himself. It's one of the most disturbing things I've ever seen in my life. I'm not quite sure what that is. It looks like he's got snot coming on his nose. There's some form of apparition, Macbeth story going on here. And those eyes. But anyway, okay, so this is William Blake, right? And he is um, the poet of the Garden of Love. Now, the thing about Blake, um, he lived mostly during the uh, mid to mid 1700s. He was born and he, he died in the early 1800s. And he was a believer in an area of thinking really which would later become known as free love but it was a, a notion that marriage is basically slavery and that we must accept homosexuality we must accept adultery and things like that the main thing was is that he believed that the body is not actually separate from the soul a lot of people thought that the body and the soul were separate entities, but he's saying it's actually the body and the soul are just extensions of each other. So um, the church's whole denial of your bodily urges that you get is actually an error. So what he's really saying is, I wouldn't say he was anti-religion, he wasn't completely anti-religion as such, but he was against the uh, restrictions that uh, religion put on us and that the church uh, deny us. So... If we look at the actual poem now, the poem goes as follows. The Garden of Love, right? Okay. I went to the Garden of Love and saw what I never had seen. A chapel was built in the midst where I used to play on the green. And the gates of this chapel were shut, and thou shalt not writ over the door. So I turned to the Garden of Love that so many sweet flowers bore. And I saw it was filled with graves and tombstones where flowers should be. And priests in black gowns were walking their rounds and binding with briars my joys and desires. Okay, so go back now. We, we forget that. Now we go back to the poet. And now that we've read the poem, let's think about this. So the poet, who, by the way, was also a painter. William Blake was a painter as well. But um, he wrote an anthology of poetry which became known as the Songs of Innocence and the Songs, Songs of Experience. So it was an anthology of poems broken up into two sections. And what the Songs of Innocence and the Songs of Experience do is that they, they contrast the innocence that we have of childhood with the kind of corruption that we have with adulthood. So if you look at some of his poems that fall into the Songs of Innocence section, you'll find poems like The Lamb, which is very much about the lamb being an innocent animal, and of course it's um, deeper meanings that we can look into. Um, and then you go into the Songs of Experience, and you think about, okay, things that he has experienced, remember it like that, and so The Garden of Love is one of those poems that comes from the Songs of Experience. So let's look at the actual poem itself. Now... I want you to imagine putting yourself into his shoes and it's the poem itself is deceptively simple you know it's only three stanzas but uh, it's actually quite complex when we have a look at what he's saying because there's a literal interpretation which is not actually the one we're looking for but there's actually a figurative interpretation that we need to assess all right so i went to the garden of love so he says he goes to this garden he goes to this green field this open land and what he saw was something that he had never seen before so he says a chapel or a church was built in the midst in the middle of this church of this garden sorry of this garden of this piece of land right dash in the middle is this church where I used to play on the green okay so he goes back to this garden he expects to find just an open green area because it says where I used to play so in other words uh, when he was a child and now he's an adult and he goes there but what he sees now is a church or a chapel built slapdash in the middle but not only about this is there a church there but the gates to this church are closed they're shut 
And written on the door of this church is, Thou shalt not. Thou shalt not. So, kind of disappointed, he turns himself... That's freaky. Anyway, let me just move it over there. Um, he turns himself to the garden. Okay, so I turn to the garden of love. Okay, don't worry about the love part yet. He turns to this garden that so many sweet flowers bore, that that garden has produced so many lovely flowers. But now in the third stanza it says, And I saw it was filled with graves. So no longer are there flowers anymore. There are graves and tombstones where the flowers should be. There should be flowers there. There used to be flowers there, but there aren't anymore. And I also saw priests walking around in black gowns doing their rounds. Like if you do your rounds, it kind of means that you're like uh, looking out uh, for any trouble or as a security um, method or something like that. And what he saw, and binding with briars my joys and desires. My joys and desires were bound, restricted with briars. And briars is a, a plant, it's got a lot of thorns on it. Um, and uh, you think about the crown that Jesus wore when he was crucified, that kind of thing with the, the thorns. So his joys and desires were bound by all these prickly thorns. Okay, so that is the literal understanding of the poem. Okay, fair enough. And you can't say that uh, that's not what he meant. That is the, the image that he wanted to create. But it's not as simple as that. Okay, so let's look at my annotations um, of the poem one by one and we'll see how we go. All right, so first of all, we have a negative view of the church, no doubt. He is um, looking at the church in a negative light. And I'm just trying to get this to focus now and it's uh, not really focusing too well. Uh, come on, come on. Okay, so uh, well, hopefully, hopefully maybe if I just do this, um, and I go like this and maybe there we go okay so now negative view of the church it's definitely a negative view he has and what he's saying is the garden of love don't worry about this tone yet okay garden of love now love in this sense is not your relationship boyfriend girlfriend or whatever kind of uh, two people in a relationship kind of love it's a love of care gentleness protection like somebody who loves you your mother loves you a good friend loves you uh, whatever the case is okay so uh, the garden of love all things good in other words so he says i went to the garden of love i so it is first person the speaker the poet he experienced this Okay, we can say from now on, the speaker. Okay, we refer to it as the speaker. Right, so he says, I went to the garden of love. Now, a garden is usually a pleasant thing, and so is love. They have positive connotations. You know, you get those signs that says, life is better when you're in the garden, and things like that. And you get uh, always get fairies in the garden, and whatever. So it's a nice place. It's relaxing, it's uh, fresh air, it's uh, out with nature, and all that. And then love comes along. Well, we all know love has a positive connotation. But it's not just any garden, and it's not just any love. He's not just talking about these kind of assets. He's, uh, he's saying that they are very important. Okay, and I've said there, the words are capitalized because their meaning is much deeper than the simple interpretation of the word. You know, it's not just a matter of looking in the dictionary and finding those words. Okay, that A, there's the rhyme scheme, which we'll come back to later. Now, the Garden of Eden, um, if you are a Christian, you know that the Garden of Eden is where Adam and Eve were placed in the garden, and then they, against God's uh, um, instructions, took the uh, forbidden fruit, ate the apple, and of course then all the original sin and the sins of the world came into being. So that is no doubt a, a reference to um, the Garden of, of Eden. Um, he says, he went there and saw what I never had seen. He's surprised. He couldn't really believe it. And now this colon over here is going to introduce to us what it is that he had never seen. Right, so here we go. What had he never seen? 
A chapel was built in the midst. Okay, a church was built in the middle. Now, if you think about it, I've put you in the middle is evasive. If I have a piece of property and I'm going to build a church, if I build it to the side, it's kind of like pushed aside out of the way. You know, I'll leave the rest of the garden available, open, but no. Right in the middle, very evasive. Okay, something that cannot be missed and something that's definitely on purpose. And it disrupts the whole garden, right? He says, where I used to play on the green. Now, the fact that he says play, uh, it's not like he used to. In, in other words, he just decided not to. He means he used to because that was when he was a child and he used to do that. Okay, so he used to play. And of course, play is uh, an enjoyable activity. It's something that is uh, nice to do. Children do it all the time. Um, you think of the expression... Um, work and no play in other words you're just having working and you're never having any time to relax or to enjoy life or anything like that okay so he used to play there on the green and of course the green is the the grassland the lawn but there's other meanings as well we can say that the color green is associated with growth um, green refers to places of freedom and play like i said and the area is not owned by anyone it's free of authority Okay, so like you have parks around town that are meant for the public. Nobody owns them. Everybody is welcome. So similarly, this garden was everyone was welcome. Right? Okay, everyone with me. Now uh, we move on. Now, and the gates of this chapel were shut. Now a church surely is supposed to be open to everyone but he's saying the gates of this chapel were closed and thou shalt not writ over the door writ is just uh, an archaic term for written and uh, if it says that it's shut and thou shalt not it's not very friendly okay I've said here in the ping it suggests intolerance and forbidding rules of the Angl Anglican faith or any Christian uh, denomination for that matter. And it's almost as if it's private property. So we went from here, from um, on the green where everybody was welcome, to a place that you can't access unless dot dot dot. Okay, because the, the doors are closed and on the doors thou shalt not. Now thou shalt not refers to the Ten Commandments of the Old Testament. Things that you may not do. So I turned to the garden of love. So be because of my disappointment of seeing that, I, um, I turned to the open area, the garden, that so many sweet flowers bore. There were so many flowers there. But not necessarily just flowers. What he's saying is that all the good times and all the joy that he had as a child are no longer there okay it says and I saw it was filled with graves so no longer are there flowers but they're tombstones graves have replaced the flowers death has replaced love because remember this whole poem is the message of um, uh, the church or religion actually corrupting us and taking away our ability to have human desires and to actually act out on those human desires which should be spontaneous we shouldn't have restrictions this is Blake's thoughts anyway right and he says and tombstones where flowers should be and priests in black gowns were walking their rounds and binding with briars my joys and desires Okay, and I've written here contrast because here we have green, which I said was associated with growth, and here we have another color, black, which is associated with death. You know, when you go to a funeral, everybody wears black, for example. If you're mourning, everybody wears black. Okay, so there was joy and love, there's now death, there's now intolerance. Okay, intolerance forbidding rules, things that you may not do. 
Okay, so he looks to the garden, and unfortunately, what he sees are tombstones or graves, no flowers, and priests. Now, the priests are almost like larger than life here, I've said, in a sense that they um, capitalized priests, in that they are almost the owners of this garden. Okay, they call the shots, in other words. And they're walking around in their black gowns. Now, that's a kind of sinister uh, image that we have there. We're walking their rounds. And I've said here, like, if you walk your rounds, it's like a route by which people are supervised or inspected. You know, like a security guard walks his rounds. Like the teacher walks around when you're doing a test to make sure that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing and you're not cheating and whatever the case is. Okay, It's almost a mechanical ritual, a set kind of... Uh, thing that they have to do. There's no kind of um, emotion or feeling sorry or pity or, or anything like that. Okay. So, remember what I said. The speaker finds this field of activities which we should be able to enjoy, but they have been made ugly by religion because on the fact, because of the fact, sorry, that they know man experiences guilt and shame. You know, we, we have these commandments, we have the Bible, we have this is what we must do, this is how we must live. And every time we don't live that way, or we obey God, I mean, sorry, we disobey God, and we don't obey the commandments, we get shame, we get guilt. And those priests are responsible for making us feel that way, for carrying out those rules and that way of living. So these priests that are walking around are binding, they're restricting with briars. And I said like a prickly thorny bush, which is actually the rules the church weighs upon us or him in terms of the speaker. My joys and my desires, my, the things that I want to do, my passions, my... Uh, desires whether it is sexual or not have been restricted by the church the church is controlling what people must do and how they must act and i said the briars was a reference to jesus's crucifixion and considering that blake is actually having taking a negative view of the church it, it was only fitting then that he would include religious links such as briars and such as um, the Garden of Eden, possibly, and thou shalt not. All right. So, now we look uh, along some notes here that I've made at the bottom. And it says that the priests in black gowns were walking their rounds. Perfectly acceptable situation. Priests walking around. But now is given sinister overtones because of the way that it's been placed within the context of the poem. That those are not good things. That we have this church with thou shalt not on the door. That the doors are closed. And that they're doing their rounds as if they're checking to see if there's any people who don't belong here. And like some kind of creatures of the dark, they, the priests, surround us, making everything bleak and unimaginative. They're devoid of compassion and even forgive, um, forgiveness. So priests are actually encouraging us to live a joyous life. As Christ suffered for us, we also have to suffer. And the idea that the church is identified by what it condemns instead of what it allows is depicted in the shut church gates and the words, Thou shalt not. So, if you look now, what is William Blake really trying to say? He's trying to say that, you know, um, I'm against the church because the church is actually telling us we can't follow our natural... Um, sort of desires and it's wrong you know we should be able to do that and by writing this poem he creates this image of a, in a literal sense of um, a church with its door closed thou shalt not and with these priests walking around in black gowns and the fact that there are no flowers anymore there's just tombstones so even in the literal sense if we knew nothing about you know the context we get an unpleasant image and it, it creates a bad image of this chapel, of this church. It's not a very friendly place. It's not very inviting. But taking on the more figurative look, we can also see that the church, not just the building, but what it stands for, the doctrines, are wrong. 
he's saying that it prevents man from living freely. It, it makes man suppress emotions and desires and feelings that it shouldn't do. And that's why I've written here that the tone is indignant. Now, what indignant means, it's like um, when you express displeasure or anger at something that you consider to be unjust because he thinks it's wrong. He really does. He thinks it's wrong. So that is the essence of the poem. And I hope that uh, this has helped you to understand the poem. And before I leave you, um, the brown here letters is obviously just the rhyme scheme. So we have the A, B, C, B, so line 2 and 4 rhyme. D, E, A, E, line 2 and 4 rhyme. And lastly, we have absolutely no rhyme scheme going here. It's just free verse F, G, H, I. And I think what he's trying to say by that is that because of our uh, restrictions, that the church is actually completely and utterly just wrong and messed up and it uh, it's just chaos now now you and I have the the ability now to question this and that's a nice thing about poetry we now have the ability to say well I don't agree you know that we have commandments we have rules and, and ways of living that God has given us because if we didn't have them then things like adultery and that would be incredibly wrong and they are so uh, you're actually out here. Whereas, on the other hand, we could argue that we agree. The church has restricted us and uh, our natural kind of feelings. And that it's all because of this original sin. Um, and the rest of us, for you know, I suppose eternity, have to live with this, these feelings of guilt and these feelings of regret and, and things like that. Um, because of the actions of the hypothetical Adam and Eve who, who, who disobeyed God. And because of that, we are all born with this original sin. So that is the poem, The Garden of Love, by William Blake. Very well-known poet. Um, didn't get much recognition when he was alive, which is quite typical for poets. But um, has become really quite a famous poet. And uh, you can read up lots about him. A very interesting man and he wrote a lot of poems as well that come from that songs of uh, innocence and uh, songs of experience so go ahead and and look at some more if you like not all of them are as complicated as this but uh, he truly is a great poet and i hope that this has has helped you